I cannot believe I'm doing this. I honestly probably shouldn't be because, let's be honest, the amount of weird Blackburn Blackburn stuff I get on this channel is already disturbing to me on many levels. So I'm going to start this video off by declaring if you have any love for your own eyesight, please do not continue watching. If you have any desire to protect your eyes from seeing what is arguably the ugliest aircraft, and I will also, as a bonus, be showing you the second ugliest aircraft to ever fly from an aircraft carrier, and I think to ever put into the sky, look away now. But, why am I doing this? Well, today my mum came home from the hospital. Not a complete clean bill of health, but she's getting better. She's well enough to be out and not be in there anymore. And, let's see. Thanks to the support of all of you, I was able to spend roughly, oh good lord, more money than I'd like to think about fixing up floorboards rapidly so that she could be allowed to come home. I had to replace, in the end it was seven sections of floorboards, but they were, I, I cut them up, so I used about three floorboards to do it. And... All sorts of joists had to be added in. It was it was a fun last 48 hours. Sunday and Monday I have spent doing this. When I haven't been recording videos. And because of that, I was able to get mum, uh, get mum for mum to come home because of your support. Because the fact that, you know, with universities being... Well, one university, which is no longer employing me, still hasn't paid me the money they owe me from my last month's work. This was the same university which was so eager to secure my services. They actually booked me, uh, you know, issued contracts earlier instead of making us interview for them. And then has done this to a whole range of staff. Fun. Inter by issuing contracts early, they, you know, they gave us, they were giving, apparently giving us security, but... They decided not to employ uh, not to employ us just after the interview period for us to go and get other jobs was over, so no chance of us getting any employment elsewhere. Ah oh, well, semester two starts soon. Hopefully there'll be some uh, some contract jobs and other jobs come up available for that period. And if I don't keep having to spend split my time between rebuilding the house to mobility standards out of um, people who are walking with a stick but are considered at risk of falling because they're not well and um, and hospital and as well as recording I will actually get some applications in but thank you because because of that it's the money from YouTube it's the money from Patreon it's the money from all of your support which has gone to all that so thank you you made it possible and as such yeah, I thought I'd do the Blackburn Blackburn. As a thank you. This was so not a good idea. Right then. Not much further ado. Shame's book plug. Now, here is the interesting thing. This book, and I am very glad it's on its second edition, because let's be honest, I've got two of them now. Both pretty. They're pretty. Look at them. The, uh, honestly, it's slightly smaller in size, the sort of paperback, but it is, oh, it's just good. And I have no words to say thank you for the things written on back. Hmm. And the Northern Mariner quote, Tribal's battles there is open as a window into a period of transition. 
for warships while offering an accessible starting place for looking at the people, events and ships that influence this unique period in history. It also provides a clear and straightforward examination of the final stages of the transition of the destroyer from ships suited to a single mission to ships that needed to perform a variety of functions in a changing world. Oh my god, thank you. Um... I did love the fact that they basically, the top paragraph on here is the last paragraph on here. It's, it's really nice. It's really nice having it. And, but the interesting thing is, the whole Tribal Destroyer stuff started when I was doing my PhD thesis on naval aviation. And the development of naval aviation in the 1920s and 30s. And... Basically, I spent my entire time trying to compare what happened, where the technology was guiding things in lead, where it was the operational need, where it was the strategical need, you know, where did the, the guidance come from? Was it politics? And I found a very, very rich history. And the whole way through this rich history, once I started looking into the operations that came about in World War II, kept being annoyed because this class of destroyers kept coming up and there was literally one book about them and it's a lovely book i mean martin bryce's tribals is an absolutely exceptional book there's only one small tiny issue of it it doesn't have a single reference in the entire thing it has a list of sources at the end but nowhere does it connect the sources with the events and it has a lot of events which I know those sources don't cover because I went and checked those sources. And it annoyed me. And that's where I started working on this. And I started adding in the battles and the darings because they continued it. Because it was a continuation of a thought process. It was con I was sort of looking at it going, if you try and isolate these three classes from each other, you are failing to deliver upon the vision. Because the tribals are the first attempt to do it, and they attempt to do it under treaty limits. The battles are the attempt to do it under wartime conditions. And the darings are the attempt to do it when you're no longer restricted by treaty or wartime. And relatively speaking, because all the fights are over carriers and victorious and cruisers and what they should be doing, no one notices how much the Royal Navy is spending on its destroyers. No one notices. They slip the daring class through with almost no debate. There's almost no discussion. That just goes through. I'm not sure if there's ever been a class like it since. Or really a class like it before. Maybe HMS Unicorn. Because Henderson did so many hoodwinks with her. But it's just... It was amazing. And so that's where the book comes from. And also... During this research, this study. I found out about the aircraft of carriers. And that included for all my sins, because why I mentioned this on uh, live so early in my, my YouTube career, I will never know. Oh my god, is it ugly looking. Meet the Blackburn Blackburn. Now, it's the first flight was in 1922. It was introduced to service in 1923. It retires in 1931. It was created to Specification 321, Naval Fleet Spotter Reconnaissance Aircraft. Now, that's an interesting designation. What does it really mean? Well, you see, it starts out as being possibly the most important aircraft you can have in a fleet. Because, let's be honest, the firepower of aircraft in the 1920s is terrible. I mean, pound for pound what they can deliver is hardly going to disrupt anything in a naval battle, let alone a behemoth like a battleship. It's, it's one of those things. If you look at the actual weapon systems and the accuracy of those aircraft in, in delivering them, there is a reason why certain tests where the ships are moored 
i.e. not moving, are uh, not crewed, so there's no one doing damage control, and people approach as if they aren't under fire because they're coming in straight line, uncontested, and, dry, and you know, basically it's a lovely manoeuvring day, are derided as being pointless and rather not helpful. They are stunts which make everyone go, oh, look, we can sink a battleship. And then you look at the, anyone who's actually looking at it rather than the image is actually looking at the reality of going, that teaches us nothing at all. It might be possible for you to sink a battleship, but doing it that way, you have just made the, any information gained useless. But what do they know could sink battleships? That's other battleships and their guns. Okay. So. What happens if an aircraft can deploy the firepower of a battleship? Then suddenly that aircraft becomes very powerful. Why does a battleship need that? Well, in the age of pre-radar, you wanted to get your accuracy up. And so you wanted a fleet spotter. Now, add into that the role of reconnaissance, and you have a very useful aircraft, because it can go out and find your opponents. And it has this whole space forward is a map table area, so they can actually plot down coordinates and make good assessments. It's more they just decide to make the <coughs> navigators um, harden up and deal the maps inside the swordfish in the open cockpit. In this period, they're actually being nice. And they, one of the reasons why they have the, cat, the space at the back is so that they can go out and do star shots, so they can do reconnaissance at night. Yeah. Raw Navy, already thinking about night fighting in 1920s. This is one of the reasons why when people turn around to me and go, but, you know, the other services are trying, and I'm going, the Royal Navy has been built, its fleet air arm has been built from the get-go as being night flying capable and night focused. Even in the 1920s, they are, taught, they are doing night operations, night reconnaissance operations, they are prepping it, they're developing it. This is why I... I find it interesting when people sort of declare, oh yeah, these people were just as good at night flying in World War II. They were by the end, after they put a huge amount of effort into it. And even then, usually only in selective units. In the US Navy case, they have specialist aircraft carriers. Or specialist squadrons. And same with the Japanese. But the Royal Navy has every layer, every squadron. Even though they're not doing a lot of night operations towards the end of World War II, they are still doing their night certifications. Why? Because it's been baked into them for generations. Think about it. If you start out as a flying officer in 1920 and you're trained to fly, whilst there is the dual rank system, which is going to be interesting in the Royal Navy, there is also the fact that from early on, the Observer Corps, the navigators, they're Royal Navy only. And the Observer's gone to be very important. Remember, a good example of them, Michael Clapp, Commodore of the 1982 Amphibious Task Group first observer to command a buccaneer squadron and he took command of the first mark ii buccaneer squadron to be nuclear to be nuclear certified so he took the first squadron of mark ii buccaneers and he got them nuclear certified so they could uh, they would deploy nuclear weapons and he did that as an observer this is another interesting thing you have in the royal navy because they have a slightly different approach to naval aviation and naval doctrine because of who's writing the aviation doctrine from the Royal Navy's side point, the side of the point of view. See, in the US Navy and the Imperial Japanese Navy, it's written by pilots. They are the dashing men who fly the planes. In the Royal Navy, the dashing men who fly the planes, they have a dual rank system and a nightmare getting promoted. There are a few who managed to make it up, but the precious few. However, the people who are selected for their brains and abilities are the, uh, to be the elite navigators slash observers to do those duties are all Royal Navy. And those people, 
then go on to other very, very good careers in the Royal Navy. In fact, if you start to look around, the first aviators to get to senior ranks in the Royal Navy aren't pilots. They're observers. And when you're talking about the Royal Navy considering its net aviation doctrine in the 1930s, when they have a committee's meeting, yes, there'll be RAF men, uh, men and pers uh, personnel there, men in this period, often pilots. But on the Royal Navy side, there'd be observers. And the ones who would go back and talk to the admirals, the ones who'd serve on the admiral's staffs, were observers. So you get a slightly different take on the deployment of aircraft, on how aircraft are used. It's going to sound strange. Observers are just as wrapped up in the joy of flying as pilots, in my experience. But pilots tend to see the plane, the aircraft as it's their steed. They are one with the machine. They are directing it, maneuvering it. Whereas the observer, especially the observers who are in this period, they like the romanticism of flying as much as the pilots. But they also have far more of a this is a tool, how do we best use this tool approach. Their understanding is different, and it shapes a slightly different. Not massively different, but different enough philosophy that within the different geostrategic nature of Britain's requirements for its navy, i.e. global empire to protect, it can't just focus on fighting one per, one other fleet and working, wanting to knock seven shades of ship out of each other. It has to concentrate on multiple potential threats from small, from pirates to peers. Leads to a different emphasis. And this is where you get something else interesting heading into the Naval Fleet Spotter Reconnaissance Aircraft role. Because very early on, it was realized, especially pre radar. How do you see enemy airstrikes coming in? How do you? Well, the Royal Navy relied on the Mark I eyeball. Great. But the Mark I eyeball on a ship is limited by the curvature of the Earth. What happens, though, if you're a Mark I eyeball on an aircraft? This is where one of the most interesting things you start to see in exercises comes across. And it's the Royal Navy's using these aircraft, like the Blackburn Blackburn, but especially the Blackburn Blackburn, which is why it stays in the service longer than its counterpart, which I'll be talking about a bit, the Avro Bison. The Blackburn goes out in 1931. The Bison isn't retired till 1920. Isn't retired in 1929. There are 55 Bison built. There are 44 Blackburn Black ones in theory. However, there is also debate as to whether or not some of the Blackburn darts. The torpedo bomber, the, the type that they were originally developed from, were converted uh, when they were running short of airframes. Because the darts, well, interesting enough, they are retired in 1933, officially. Officially. And so there's a lot of those going around. And in fact, the darts, there were officially 126 of them built, including some exports. But they were being built from 1922 to 1928. And if you think about 126 being built over that sort of seven year ish period, because 22 inclusive to 28. Um,
That's roughly 20 aircraft a year. Which doesn't quite match up with some of the consumptions. Again, even if you add in the Blackburn, Blackburn's production line, which is running alongside simultaneously, adds in another 44 and takes you up to a whopping, let's be honest, this was a, this is a massive total for the period, 170 aircraft. It still doesn't quite explain all that's consumed. And Blackburn have a very good and close relationship with the Royal Navy. And an interesting relationship with the Fleet Air Arm, which I have to admit in this period has an interesting relationship with the Royal Air Force as a whole. Let me rephrase that. They have a good relationship with the Royal Air Force. They have an interesting relationship with the Air Ministry. There are lots of sections of the Royal Air Force which have interesting relationships with their own Air Ministry. It's when you realise that the, we often talk about the bomber mafia taking over the Royal Air Force and then focusing on the bombers and ignoring the fighters and the development of single-seat aircraft right up until close to World War II, when they suddenly realise, hang on, these things will work. The thing is, there are lots of voices you can find, including people like Dowding, etc., who have been arguing against that and have been outside that circle. And what you realise is that it's not the Royal Air Force it's that the Royal Air Force got hijacked by a faction within the Royal Air Force who believed they were doing the best thing. And the trouble is, people at the road to um, a very bad place, a very, very bad place, is paved with good intentions. And people often do more, uh, will often behave more stupid when they believe when I say more stupidly, more, uh, I got critiqued once of being saying short-sightedly, but in when I'm talking about short-sighted, I'm talking about when you're looking at the near-term or long-term future. They are presuming because of how things are now, that is how they're going to be and remain to be. The bomb will always get through is a lovely mantra as long as there isn't radar. But the fact is, you have a problem even before that. Because the information being used by some of those people that argue against the bomb wars get through comes from the Blackburn Blackburn in its role as basically airborne early warning. Because with it flying high enough, spotting, A, it was up there looking, and there was often a fighter patrol up there as well looking. The fighter patrol might dive off. But the thing is, this could then make a call to the carrier and tell them the fighters are going off, give them the direction of where they're going, and where the enemy's coming from, and say if there's any other attacks. And the carrier can launch its alert fighters. All before the enemy get within range. Because, you see, if they're coming over the horizon, and it's 10, 15 miles away, that's not enough time to react if they are doing even. The Blackburn Blackburn's wonderfully top speed of 122 miles per hour. Let's be honest, if you are 10 miles away and you're doing 100, let's say 120 miles an hour, let's just make it easy math for me. That is 2 miles a minute. That means you're going to cover that distance in 5 minutes. For alert fighters to launch and intercept you, that's going to be interesting. But if I spot you at 50 miles away, well, that's 25 minutes. 30 miles away is 15 minutes. And I don't have to be flying that high to be able to do that. So, reconnaissance, fleet spotter, able to use the most powerful weapon at an aircraft's disposal at its time period, and more importantly, also reconnaissance aircraft capable of night operations. The Blackburn Blackburn. 
ugly as anything, but really quite useful. Really, really quite useful. Now, the stats. Well, the stats are like we'd think they would be. They're not that impressive. It's got a crew of three. Now, interesting enough, the crew would often be a pilot sitting up there. You can see them in the stand. <laughs> um, sorry, it's just no. A, a telegraphist, an air gunner. And an observer. Now, the observer is also the navigator. And would also sometimes man the gun if they had to. And would also man the, uh, send the signals if they had to. If the telegraphist air gunner was too busy using the gun to try and defend them, then yeah, they would be. Then in the nicest way, the observer would go, "Yeah, go man the use the gun. I'll do this. I'll send the radio signals." And of course, that means you've got three sets of eyes. Now, yes, the pilot is probably concentrating on flying the aircraft, but we'll probably also be watching the space in front of them. Rather useful, that one. And with all these windows, and as you can see, if we go back to the previous picture, windows on both sides of the aircraft, you've got lots of spaces to view out and view the world around you. Especially, And then you've got the cockpit at, at the rear as well. You've got a lot of viewing space to view the world around you. Which is useful for observing, for reconnaissance, and for airborne early warning. Length, 36 feet 2 inches, or 11.02 meters. Wingspan, 45 foot 6 inches, or 13.87 meters. Height, and this thing is big, 12 foot 6 inches, 3.8 meters, roughly. As a wing area which is roughly 60 meters squared, or 650 square feet. Empty weight, 3,929 pounds or 1,782 kilograms gross weight 5,962 pounds that's 2,704 kilograms and that's usually what they'd be operate, they'd be taking off at but their maximum takeoff weight if they were carrying all the extra fuel and everything they could carry could be 6,648 pounds that's 3 tons a little over 3 tons now, in that, they would carry all the survival gear necessary for the free of the crew, the free crew, if they ditched in the water, and all the gear they needed for the various requirements of operating over the sea. That includes a whole lot of navigation equipment, which you don't need if you're not going to operate over the sea, because if you're operating over land, well, in this period, you can, of course, maybe you recognise uh, churches or something else like that, or other landmarks. Alternatively. Alternatively, there is another option. You can land. Seriously, the amount of time young pilots, when they're learning flying around the UK, land in farmers' fields. It almost becomes a running trope that they're doing it to check out the farmers' daughters. It just... The, um, if you look in a certain period in the 1920s, there is a running form of literature genre, which is literally lost pilot, lands in the field, meets beautiful farmer's daughter, finds out where they are, very thankful, flies off back to base, returns later, begins wonderful affair. Various issues ensue where they have a small falling out. He then goes off, does something heroic, flies back to uh, make up to her and apologize or whatever they need to do, and they end up getting married. And before you ask how I know about this wonderful genre of literature, well, let's put it this way. I inherited my ability to collect books from my mother. She also has a very impressive collection of books. She inherited her ability to collect books from her mother. We still have quite a large chunk of her mother's collection.
<clears throat> it teaches you so much about the 1920s and 30s to read through what was popular fiction for young ladies at the time. Anyway, leaving that to one side, and the many boxes of books, which are basically the same storyline. Power Plant was a single Napier 2B Lion, which was a very reliable engine. The Napier Lion is this engine which just keeps going and just keeps iterating. If you want an example of what I mean by iterating, it gets up to the XIA, basically what's sometimes called as um, <clears throat> the Super Lion, which was produced in 1928. But it had first been produced, a Model 1, in 1918. It's a very reliable, very good, very capable engine. It's not particularly powerful. Now, usually the Napier 2 has a rating of power of 480 horsepower. Brake horsepower. At 2,200 RPM. The one fitted to the Blackburn Blackburn was 450 horsepower. There is a reason for this. A reason for this. It's the 2B, which was the navalized variant, which meant it was adapted for operating over salt water. That cost it brake horsepower. Why? Because it was marinized so it wouldn't corrode but also meant slightly different materials were being made for it. And again, this is something which has to be built up into engines. What is interesting is the Napier Lyman uh, V7, uh, 7B, the VIIB, which was produced in 1927, had 875 brake horsepower and was used for the Supermarine S5, which was, of course, their racer in the 1920s, um, a really good Schneider Trophy a competition racer, and also the Gloucester 4, which was also a racing aircraft. In fact, the Napier Lions supply a, lot, a couple of generations of Supermarines. They also produced the Sea Lion in 1933, which was used by the British powerboat companies. Uh, 63 foot Type 2 high speed launch which, of course, was used to uh, rescue pilots when they fell out of the sky. It worked well. They were good engines, and they knew how to make them. Now, the top speed of the Blackburn Blackburn, as I've said, is uh, 122 miles per hour at 3,000 foot. And no, I'm not joking. You could overtake it in your car. And I'm not, I'm not talking a fast car. No, no. If you have a Mini, a Mini, an old Mini, you could overtake a Blackburn Blackburn on a calm day, a windless day. It still couldn't beat you. Not by much, but it, you, you still couldn't beat you. But it was fast enough for its job. It has endurance of 4 hours and 15 minutes. Standard fuel load. I've heard of them doing longer. When they go maximum takeoff weight and maximum fuel. Although they, unlike the Swordfish, that later on aircraft, um, do not have the habit of making their, uh, when they put in their long range fuel tanks, uh, making the person sitting in the rear cockpit be waist deep in aviation fuel. That, of course, was the joy for the observers when they were flying into Taranto. With the Italian AA fire going off around them, most of them were still either still up fairly deep in aviation fuel, or more importantly, their clothes were laced to it. So let's be honest, that's a very, very brave person. But in the Blackburn Blackburn, you didn't have that problem. Didn't have that issue. Altitude. That's another interesting one. Okay. 12,950 feet. Now, the Royal Navy 
Well, the Royal Naval Air Service had started off by looking at oxygen. The RAF had continued it on. And so, in, this was in World War I. So, yes, they do have oxygen supplies. There are some rather interesting things, okay? What you tend to find in terms of aircraft like the Blackburn Blackburn is you get a very interesting mix of personnel. For starters, uh, as far as the Navy's concerned, this is pretty much the most important aircraft flying other than the torpedo bombers, as it's the one which really focuses the primary teeth of the Royal Navy, the battleship guns in the 1920s. So, the observers who go in there are pretty much the creme de la creme. They're also, it's kind of self-selecting in that, which uh, which way do you want to go? Do you want to go torpedo route, or do you want to go this route, spotter reconnaissance route? And the reason I say that is because you have to consider most of the fighters in this period are single-seat fighters. Most of them are short-range aircraft, single-seat. They're not expected to do more than defensive duties of the fleet. So, you know, they're going to stay within, well... When we say visual range of the for, of the formation, visual range for a given altitude. Okay, okay. It, it, they stay within the range that they can zoom up and look around and go, ah, ships. Those are most likely mine. If they're not, we're going to be in trouble. That's the scenario. So they don't. The observers don't go into that. But also, those squadrons are usually ones which get the... How do I put this? They get a strange mixture of the fleet air arm pilots are from the Navy, naval fleet air arm pilots, who you, usually the air ministry tries to assign they're the ones who that they think are the most, um, uh, most potentially problematic from a political point of view if they get to senior ranks. So that, you know, in fighters, they can restricts their promotion slightly more than anything else because it's slightly more under their, it's even more under their control. Whereas in the units where there are multiple naval officers, there is, the, who are on their naval track, it becomes far more obvious, far more quickly to personnel, they're not getting promoted at the same rate, that there are issues going on. And the trouble is, if those with political connections realise this, you could start getting really annoying questions in the House of Lords, let alone the House of Commons. It's just terrible, terrible. So you want to keep them in fighter squadrons. But that means the pilots who end up in Blackburn Blackburns and those thralls tend to be the ones who are interesting. This means these squadrons, and I'll be talking about the various squadrons they're fitted, they're, they're work with, um, have personalities. And they start to develop things. For example, they start to try and work on making themselves go higher altitude, because they think the higher altitude they are, especially on clear days, longer day, along the range, they're sort of field of view, the more they can spot enemy aircraft coming in, the more they can spot enemy ships. This leads to all sorts of interesting work going on there, including some attempts were made at pressurizing the cabin. Because of the doors, and etc., you have to move between you sort of place, it's actually quite difficult. If you can think of, consider a pressure unit on a submarine, it you know you have two doors. You have at least a double door system, and same with spacecraft. So you can have internal door, external door. So there's never a direct link between the two. There were lots of ideas about how to do that on the aircraft. I, from my understanding, none of them worked. Okay, from my understanding. But the fact is, they were working on this. They were working on these ideas to try and get themselves as high altitude as they could. They're fun. And of course, two 303 Lewis guns. I'm not sure if the rate of climb really matters, because let's be honest, it's slow. It's three and a half meters a second. It's 690 feet a minute. It's 
It's not going to win any competitions with that speed. It's just not. Now, the service, that is interesting. They begin when they're part of, before you have the sort of the fleet air arm, which is formed officially in 19, uh, you know, is slightly later. It's a, it's an interesting debate as to when it the fleet air arm is officially stood up. Some people put it directly back to 1918, but not really. Uh, it, they start off with number 422, Fleet Spotter, Flight, Royal Air Force. And number... Well, that's 1923 to 28, they're with them. And also number 420, Fleet Spotter, Flight, Royal Air Force. 1926 to 28, and this is part of the fleet air arm, but they, they're officially badged as part of the Royal Air Force because all aircraft are part of the Royal Air Force. You know, the idea of the air being one. Eventually, they are transferred over to 449 and 450. Now, 449, Fleet Spotter Reconnaissance Flight, and 450 Fleet Spotter Reconnaissance Flights have very interesting histories. They really do. Because 450 is eventually combined with 445 <coughs> to become 820 Naval Air Squadron. 820 Naval Air Squadron is the squadron which takes part in the hunt for Bismarck from the Ark Royal which does all sorts of things in the Indian Ocean during Operation C, and is around to this day. It's a critical Merlin squadron for the Royal Navy. It's flown some interesting aircraft in its history. It's had the Fairy Free, the Fairy Seal, the Blackburn Shark, the Fairy Swordfish, the Fairy Battle, Fairy Albacore, Fairy Barracuda, Grumman Avenger, Fairy Firefly, Grumman Avenger again, uh, Fairy Gannet. Lo they had a love affair with fairies. Uh, the Westland Whirlwind, and then Westland Wessex, and then the Westland Sea King, and finally, of course, the Augusta Westland Merlin. They're on the Mark II. So, that's what one of the flights goes on to become. They have an interesting history. 449 was eventually transferred into, well, Fort was part of the force which created 822 Naval Air Squadron. Why am I bringing up this? Well, those, of course, events happen after. 442 and 449 together are combined together to form 822 Squadron. And those events happen after the Royal Navy starts to get more and more control of the Fleet Air Arm. One of the interesting things you find out when you're looking through the history and when, when you're working through it in the Blackburn, Blackburn, to an extent, actually benefits from this in a way. It's one of the few types of aircraft which actually benefit from it. Is the obsession the Air Ministry has with preventing the fleet air arm being organized in units greater than flights. Why does that matter? Because the base unit of your organization is going to define all your doctrine and your thinking. The moment you organize in squadrons, you also have more senior officers involved. Everyone goes up a rank. The people you're having to deal with. And the Royal Navy likes lieutenant commanders to be in charge of squadrons. They do like them to be commanded by lieutenant commanders. Occasionally you'll have a commander, but they prefer would prefer a lieutenant commander to be in charge of a squadron. And then the wing commander is a commander. Makes sense. And that means that you, when you have your captain on your ship, on your aircraft carrier, there is a very definite chain of command going on there because the wing commander is a commander and there's also a commander who's the executive officer of the ship. And so you have those two commander, uh, commanders and you ha then have the captain. If we consider with the modern aircraft carriers, there's all sorts of interesting discussions over the chain of command and over the actual rank of their commanding officer. 
And there was also discussion at various points as to whether or not that officer would have to be a Commodore. Why? Because there was a debate as to what would be the rank of the wing commander on the air group, because it's a joint air group, with the F 35s being a joint project and joint management. Squadron organization matters. Squadron organization gives the Navy something to organize itself around in terms of its aircraft. But, curiously enough, if you think about it from an operation of not reconnaissance aircraft in terms of the search reconnaissance aircraft, which Blackburns could be used for, but from the point of view of their AWACS sort of role, their airborne early warning role, six aircraft, that's perfect. That allows you to keep two in the air, at least one on alert, be doing maintenance on another two, and have one more ready to go down in the hangar. It, that's fine. And actually, you could argue the Royal Navy sort of loses something because they find it far more difficult to maintain that role once they have squadrons, because the squadrons are being asked to do the full reconnaissance role, the torpedo strike role, because they are often swordfish, which are torpedo spotter reconnaissance aircraft. And you can see there's a problem there, because that's now got the torpedo role, which is a full squadron activity to go off and attack targets, and you've got the spotter role, okay, lovely, but also the reconnaissance role. And then you added on, quite quickly, the anti-submarine role, wandering around, which these also had fun doing, and you suddenly realise there is a problem here. Whereas used to you had a dedicated flight, now you don't. Now you pass it off and the role between the various squadrons of TSRs you had on board the ship, which made it a far more interesting thing because you didn't have specialists. Rather interesting if we then look back at, look at how the Royal Navy is then dealing with airborne early warning and how the US Navy deals with airborne early warning and everyone else does it today, is it's a flight. It's a dedicated flight of dedicated aircraft supported by a central squadron. And I do sometimes wonder if you consider how the Royal Navy was working in the early 1920s and how they were working with far more mixed air groups because they weren't quite getting so obsessed with long-range logistics and paring the aircraft down as much as they can to multi-role aircraft. They were more prepared to accept something like, well, in this case, the Blackburn Blackburn is a remodeled Blackburn Dart, i.e. the torpedo bomber re reshaped. So it's got all similar things as the Blackburn Dart. So logistically, you can support one or the other. It doesn't really matter. But the thing is, I do wonder if, Considering how useful this role was, if the Royal Navy had been operating and developing itself first and had been control of its fleet air arm completely and not had to keep fighting over things, and therefore not made the squadron, forming up the squadron, actually an almost a goal, I do wonder if they might have designed their carriers around maintaining a flight of aircraft for this purpose. It could have been an interesting thing. It could have been an interesting thing, especially once radar started coming, because, let's be honest, the first, if you've already got a dedicated group of aircraft which are about airborne early warning, and radar exists, what is the first thing you're going to do? Can we fit radar on them? Can we fit radar on them? It's going to be your thing. And that would have been a really interesting thing for early World War II. You know, it doesn't... If the Royal Navy's got airborne early warning radar of even rudimentary type. At a certain point, that's gonna call, that's gonna stop a lot and make a lot of attacks a lot more difficult for people to get for, uh, for people to get through in World War Two. Could have all sorts of impact. Is also, as we know, if we consider once they do have swordfish with radar and they have albacores for radar how well those aircraft are guided, able to guide in on their targets at night or through thick fog. Because let's be honest, the ships in World War II are not designed with any idea of stealth. 
in terms of specifics of their service, well, they started off with HMS Eagle in the Mediterranean. They also seem to have gone quite quickly to other carriers as well. Uh, they were beloved in exercises. And there are a list of exercises between 1925 onwards where Blackburn Blackburns and their spotting role, their reconnaissance role and their early warning role are all really critical. One of the interesting things is an air defence exercise, which I think was 1927, but I could be wrong on that one. I think it was M from 1927, but it could be, it could be a different one. Uh, I'm going from memory here. I shouldn't be going from memory. I should have consulted my notes on this, but they're on another hard drive, which is in the house and it's raining. And honestly, I'm not going to go there to get it. So just please note, I'm saying I think it's M from 1927, but I could be wrong. There's actually a flight of torpedo bombers coming in low, aiming for, I think it's HMS Nelson. I think it was Nelson. And they get spotted, and the fighters get intercepted. Uh, the fighters intercept them. And the fighters intercept them from HMS Eagle. And why are they spotted? Well, the black man, black man. So it's an advantageous tool. It really is. It's a capable aircraft. It's just ugly as anything. And usually I will go, well, there's a beauty in function and it being adapted to its function, but that's just ugly. I mean, seriously. Even in those colours. As much work as they've done it, and yes, there was a float plane variant. <sighs> Why? Just no, no, no. But still, it was useful. It gives you an interesting idea and a sort of viewpoint of where naval aviation could have gone. My distinct suspicion is that if the flight system to an extent of the aircraft for this sort of role, a sort of fleet spotter reconnaissance, Please note that fleet spotter reconnaissance. There's a lot of word, work being done by fleet there. If that had continued, I think it would have been a flight of them. And I think you'd have seen adjustments because Ark Royal probably wouldn't have been adapted, to, wouldn't have been emphasized around carrying them, although she would have been able to carry them. Uh, she was primarily a strike carrier, so whatever successor aircraft took on the fleet spotter role after the Blackburn Blackburn departed service in sort of transitioning directly into that role not like Swordfish which sort of fills in occasionally in the Shark which also tries to fill in and they do well in exercise and they do sometimes do well in World War II but it's, they're not really as dedicated to it as these, sh uh, these flights were I think if they continue with them I think you would have seen probably An illustrious class which is designed around a slightly larger hangar. Because they are going to need them. They are going to want to have six of them. So they're going to have to go with the 42 aircraft hangar. Rather than the 36. Which is interesting from a space perspective. It's how do you get those extra six spaces? Well, you can do one of two things. You could have deck edge lifts and slightly reorientate the spaces internally so that you can have the space for the deck edge lifts, which also gives you dead zones in terms of the um, hangar. 
you could extend the hanger probably aft is easier than forward you need to slightly extend the vessel as well but it didn't happen it didn't happen and that's sad it's sad more importantly from the fact that this sort of period of naval aviation development gets forgotten gets overlooked the 1920s and 30s get forgotten so much so 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 much uh, i mean when i was doing my phd thesis i think i wrote the line in it that it's as if you have these two bright stars these two really close bright stars and because they're so bright no one sees the constellation in between them the amount of books you can read which literally will have 150 pages on world war one 200 pages on world war two and about 30 pages of the war of the the 20 odd years in between and yeah, I know it's exciting. Model 1 and Model 2 are really exciting. There's lots of action, lots of daring do. But this is where you get the idea from a lot of people that the ideas of World War 2 suddenly appear in World War 2. They don't. A lot of them are developments of ideas that have first appeared in World War 1. Honestly, the fleet spotting aircraft and using as airborne early warning actually appears in Model 1. It's one of the ideas behind Nature's Furious. So it can spot Zeppelins when they're further away or when they're hiding in cloud. Stop them reporting the position. It's considered a counter-reconnaissance methodology. You have a aircraft up there which has long uh, has longer range endurance and viable is viable for endurance up there. Going to step there for hours because that makes sense. And then you have fighters ready to zoom up when you acquire a target which is worthy of their interception. Makes sense. It's the fleet spotter roll. Yes, the focus of the fleet spotter roll is massively on bombardment. Don't get me wrong, it's on the bombardment. It goes boom, 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 that's what they're focusing on. But they've also got the other role of being a fleet lookout. And yes, it's not perfect. It's a person, it's a couple of people with binoculars. It's not going to be perfect. And it might be two of the air, two aircraft up. But compared to nothing, it's a big improvement. And the pace and movement of aircraft in the 20s means that it's not an inviolable system. Year of Technology is up and next year is going to be the year of the aircraft carrier possibly the year of the aircraft carrier and flagship i'm still deciding if i want to put how if i want to put some major sales stuff in there because you know me i like doing a bit of age sale. i like this year and that we started off and almost went chronologically forward now if you look it sort of it slowly works forward to the present day i liked that as a flow but here is the other the Alvaro Bison, which is... Oh, forget. It's almost as ugly as the Blackburn Blackburn, but for some reason it isn't. And I'd argue it isn't because... I'd say the shaping of the Blackburn Blackburn, the, the, the whole snout of the Alvaro Bison just looks slightly better. Uh, the fact that it's got space cut out for the pilot between the, uh, beneath the wing, uh, well, in front of the wing, sort of a bit of a curve around them, it also adds some interest, and it just looks different. Plus, there's the huge, great big windows, so to my mind, whereas the Blackburn Blackburn always looks a bit like it's trying to be some sort of ship with portholes, the other bison just looks like it's a greenhouse which has taken the flight. You know, it happens. It, it could happen. At least a comfy lounge, let's be honest. Look at that space. 
It's also powered by the Napier line. It's introduced in 1921. Well, 1922. It's introduced. First flight's 1921 and retired in 1929. It's a useful aircraft again. It's 421 and 423 of the Fleet Spotter flights. Uh, they would had several interesting modifications. And technically, they could carry a crew of four. Yes. They could carry a pair of observers, or a pair of telegraphist air gunners, or a telegraphist and an air gunner. What can I say? They had one fixed forward firing machine gun and one machine gun on a scarf ring. But uh, let's put this way, they had a maximum speed of 108 miles per hour. A cruising speed of 90 miles per hour. A uh, service ceiling of 12,000 feet, and their rate of climb was actually more impressive. It was 450 feet a, a minute, or 2.3 meters a second, but, you know, that was the advantage. They had the more powerful Napier Lion engine. But overall, probably weren't as good as aircraft as their slightly more blunt nose looks like it's actually designed to fight its way through the air not actually fly through the air counterpart and as said the Blackburn Blackburn as ugly as it was was slightly more successful ever so slightly more successful Thank you very much for watching. Now, I normally, and I'm not going to change this time, come for a question. And the question is quite simple. Starting from the Blackburn Blackburn and moving forward, if the Royal Navy gains control of the fleet air arm when it's first trying in 1930, when it points its first Rear Admiral aircraft carriers, Admiral Henderson. When he's appointed, if they get control of aviation at that point, and they haven't yet transitioned into squadrons, they're still at flights, and so it's all organised by the Navy. And as such, the Royal Navy decides to keep these aircraft. They decide to keep the role going, because they don't have to fight and justify every single type, every single specification of the Air Ministry. They can just do it off their own back. And one of the problems for justifying this with the Air Ministry was they honestly believed it couldn't be any use because there's surely it can't it can't help in terms of spotting air fire bombers coming in. Surely it well doesn't work. <sighs> there were some seriously weird people in the Air Ministry at certain points. Not reflective of the wider Royal Air Force at all. There's just... Yeah, it's just weird. Political arms of armed forces can become incredibly toxic very quickly. As they often get overtaken by the group which prefer to pontificate than do. And you have sections in all armed forces like that. So let's say they retain it, and they retain some form of group capacity, as in flight of this sort of aircraft were standard equipment for all carriers. Even probably Ark Royal would get a flight of them. As in, not the Blackburn Blackburn, but a successor in the fleet spotter reconnaissance role, in terms of the fleet spotter reconnaissance and the airborne early warning duties. How do you think that's going to change things? How do you think that would change for the Royal Navy, even if they don't get radar any sooner? How do you think it changes things? I myself think they might get radar sooner, considering the Royal Navy has their own independent air radar development. And honestly, tacking radar is, because of the work of beacons, etc., already is tacked straight into the aircraft carrier program immediately, so... If they have control of naval aviation in terms of procurement of aircraft from 1930, I, I can't see why it wouldn't be. And these would be larger aircraft, larger... Look at this. Look at this compared to this, the Blackburn Dart that came from. Imagine an adapted fairy swordfish. 
or a Blackburn, adapted Blackburn shark. Potentially keeps the Blackburn, makes the Blackburn shark be more justified to keeping in service if it's got a kin which is doing this role. And that has some slight differentials for history. Such an aircraft would be large enough that you could probably get radar on there earlier because you'd have space and you'd have capacity to carry the load. Who knows how that could change things. And I'd like to hear what you think the possibility would be. Also, as always, if there are any aircraft you consider more ugly than the Blackburn, Blackburn, I will take suggestions down below. But honestly, I have seen most of them before, and they have some reason for looking quite that ugly. The Blackburn, Blackburn doesn't. It's just Blackburn being Blackburn as a company. They either produce very attractive aircraft or absolutely awfully looking aircraft. Let's be honest, the Dart, which the Blackburn Blackburn comes from, is not exactly the prettiest aircraft in the world at the point where it's created. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed and thank you again for all your support and all your kindness. It really wouldn't be possible to do any of this without it. Thank you.